minutes here. We're just Flight local one. from entry interface. We don't need these ones and zeros, as Swati said, uh, but to land safely. But we we really need it for our own uh, health and well-being today to keep our nerves in control. But Around this time, a second spacecraft, Maven, should begin picking up telemetry from Perseverance, and will continue to record that telemetry until several minutes post landing. We won't get that data for several hours after landing, as it's being recorded, and then will be forwarded to Earth later. We are continuing to receive heartbeat tones, indicating that everything is nominal. We're currently at about three minutes until entry interface. Okay. Very soon we'll be getting ones and zeros, I hope, from our radio on the rover. The entry interface is nothing more than just an arbitrary place in the sky that we've defined to be above the atmosphere. But, th but from that point on, uh, there's definitely uh, atmosphere, and above it, there isn't We are any. two minutes from entry interface. Perseverance is to transmit heartbeat tones, indicating everything is nominal. So the tones can tell us whether something is bad or not is happening. So, so far, the heartbeat is, is doing well. So the vehicle thinks it's, help, it's uh, in good shape to land, which is a great sign. Uh, We're just under two minutes from entry interface. As it gets closer to Mars, Perseverance is actually being pulled in by gravity and accelerating. By the time Perseverance reaches entry interface point, she should be going just under 5.4 kilometers per second. We're at about 90 seconds from entry interface and standing by for Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to pick up the telemetry. We are one minute from entry interface. MROs are in receive mode. We have confirmation that the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is now relaying data from Perseverance. We're about 30 seconds from entry interface. Perseverance is going about 5.2 kilometers per second and is about 190 kilometers altitude above the surface of Mars. Confirm your HF data flow. About seconds from entry interface. 5.3 kilometers per second and an altitude of uh, about 150 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation of entry interface. Perseverance is currently going 5.3 kilometers per second at an altitude of about 120 kilometers from the surface of Mars. The spacecraft is now waiting until it begins feeling the atmosphere of Mars to slow it down. Once there is enough atmosphere, it will start controlling its path to the landing target. Navigation is also confirming that we can see a little bit of that slowdown of the atmosphere on the Perseverance entry capsule. 
Our current velocity is about 5.36 kilometers per second and an altitude of about 67 kilometers from the surface. We are probably seeing MRO plasma blackout at this point. The vehicle should be doing its turns right now. MRO has lost lock. Perseverance. We have indications that Perseverance is now performing bank reversals in the atmosphere. These are the steps in order to control its distance to the landing target. Uh, Perseverance has just passed through the point of maximum deceleration and has indicated that it felt approximately 10 Earth Gs of deceleration. MRO has lock again. Yes, yes, yes. We saw a small outage uh, of the UHF telemetry from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter during that peak heating phase likely caused by the plasma blackout. Perseverance is still continuing to perform bank reversals in the atmosphere to control its distance to the landing target. Perseverance is going about one kilometer per second at an altitude of about 16 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have entered heading alignment, which means Perseverance is no longer trying to control the distance to Mars, but in, to the target on Mars, but instead is flying straight to the target. Our current velocity is about 550 meters per second at an altitude of about 15 kilometers from the surface. MRO is reporting good telemetry lock. We are coming upon the straighten up. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Yes. Yes, yes. The navigation yes. has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Yes, yes, yes. Perseverance now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 yes. .6 kilometers of the surface. Right. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. Almost there. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Yes. 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 We have priming of the landing engines.
velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Gear and safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. We've lost direct to earth tones. As expected, as expected. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. UHF is good. Touchdown yeah. confirmed. Yeah. Perseverance yeah. safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. Yeah. At this point, the descent stage has flown away to a safe distance. Perseverance is continuing to transmit direct through Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to Earth. Oh my God. Oh. Oh. reports they're still getting telemetry from the lander. Uh, all right, all stations. Uh, we got it. Touchdown We're, there. Confirmed. We're gonna wait for the images. I, uh, wow. This is so exciting. I, the team is beside themselves. It's, oh, it's, it's so surreal. Stay tuned, we might get some pictures. He's great. riding on this. Yeah. yeah, we just heard the news that Perseverance is alive on the surface of Mars. Yeah. It's not, uh, it's not the flight. Safety. Flight, we have seen the completion of EDL 3000. Copy activity. That is as expected. Okay. MRO is still seeing a strong signal from the lander. We have just heard the news yes. that Perseverance is alive on the surface of Mars. Congratulations to the mission. And Looks like we have some more news in. It looks like we're getting the first image. Here, take a look at the first image. Flight, this is OL3. I have uh, the target point on the map when you are ready. We are ready, OL3. Go for it. <laughs> Flight, I'll be uh, moving in, showing you the safe zone that we've landed in. image from Perseverance on the surface of Mars. Now it comes from the engineering cameras known as the hazard camera. Uh, this camera is mainly used to help the rover drive safely around Mars and we will get higher resolution photos later in the day.
in our second image is in okay this these these we have a camera in the front and out rear of the, of the, of the spacecraft uh, it's uh, it's it's they're near the ground so these are pretty close so you can see the wheels there uh, and and and, the, and they're a little dirty because we've got uh, glass covers over these these cameras but uh, we took these seconds after landing so so they're still dusted in the air from our landing event uh, so this is this is happening. Um, uh, you know, this happened just seconds ago. Just arrived, and uh, this is really amazing. And, and uh, we even know where we landed. Uh, this is the most amazing thing. Their vehicle has told us where, where it's landed because it knew, figured it out. You know, this is a sign. NASA works. NASA works. And when we put our arms together and our hands together and our brains together, we can succeed. This is what NASA does. This is what we can do as a country on all of the problems we, we have. We need to work together to do these kinds of things and make success happen. And joining us now is the acting administrator of NASA, Steve Jurisic. Steve, welcome and congratulations. Hey, thank you. What an amazing day. It, how does it feel to have another rover on Mars? Uh, it, it's amazing um, uh, to have perseverance, joy, and curiosity on Mars. And what a, what a just a credit to the team. I mean, just what an amazing team um, to work through all the adversity um, that goes and all the challenges that go with landing a rover on Mars, plus the challenges of COVID and, um, and just an amazing accomplishment. And what does this mean for NASA and its future plans? So for robotic exploration, you know, every time we um, execute a mission with new instruments, we discover new things and things we never thought we would discover. So that's, that always informs our future robotic missions, uh, both landers, rovers, and orbiters. Um, this mission also has technology on it. One of the cool things is the Ingenuity helicopter. Um, it's, a, it's an experiment on this mission, but if it's successful, we can use it as an observation, science observation platform by putting instruments on it, and also use it as a scout um, for future rover missions. And, uh, and then just the entry, set, and landing um, capability. Um, it'll allow us to land more and more larger, more ambitious robots on the surface of Mars. And then for human exploration, um, we have the MEDLI, Med, uh, Mars Entry Set and Landing Instrumentation, which is going to give us EDL information. Um, we have the Mars Environmental Dynamics Analyzer. It's going to give us uh, properties, size and properties of dust particles, because when, when we send people, we're going to have to deal with that dust. Um, and uh, just, it's just, this is just an incredible mission because of the science and the technology and then caching samples for a Mars sample return mission. That will be a, an amazing mission, the first round trip to Mars and back, and bringing those samples cached by Perseverance back to Earth to uh, examine with state-of-the-art um, equipment in our laboratories here on Earth. We have so much to look forward to. And we also have a student question coming in from Landon. Let's take a look. 
Hi, my name is Landon Applegate. I'm in sixth grade, and I'm going to Academy for Academic Excellence. And my question is, do you think we could get resources from Mars to help on future missions, or even as like a launching point? Great question, Landon. Actually, we have an experiment called the, Mox, the Mars Oxygen in situ resource utilization experiment or MOXIE and it's going to gem demonstrate generating oxygen from atmospheric CO2 and that could help gener uh, develop, you know, uh, generate breathable oxygen and even if we can liquefy it oxidizer for propulsion systems so that's a tech demo on perseverance and then we're going to continue to characterize the frozen water on and below the surface of Mars and eventually try to figure out how to extract that water from the Martian soil or what we call regolith. And then we can use that for potable water and also break it down into oxygen and hydrogen for rocket fuel. So absolutely, we're gonna to try to eventually figure out how to live off the land to support human missions to Mars. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today, Steve. Thank you. And now that Perseverance has safely touched down on Mars, Let's learn more about what's in store for the rover. Joining us now is Surface Mission Manager, Jessica Samuels. Jessica, your Surface Operations team has now taken over. What are they doing now? Yes, hi Raquel. We are so excited here in the Surface Mission, mission Support area. Uh, the team will do a handover with the entry, descent, and landing team and uh, uh, pass any critical information and then this team behind us will be the team that does the health and safety assessments daily as we progress on this mission. And what do the upcoming weeks look like for your team? So as we enter Mars time now, uh, the commanding team will be working overnight while the rover is asleep so that uh, we can perform the initial checkouts of our key rover functions and our science instruments. And we have to do this all in time for the regularly scheduled communication pass, which happens in the morning. And so we will be working around the clock uh, making sure that uh, Perseverance is healthy and um, we will begin this exciting adventure. Ed, can you tell me what's it like living on Mars time? It's, uh, it's a little bit like constantly, uh, you know, flying and changing your time zone. Uh, the rover, um, you know, on Earth, the rover wakes up at the same time every day, but on Earth, that's 40 minutes later. So the team is going to be shifting our work schedule by 40 minutes as we come into work over the next few weeks. So it, it, it'll be uh, it'll be exciting, and uh, and some uh, some late oh, late nights, but uh, but we're also excited, and uh, we uh, can't wait. It's a whole new lifestyle. Yes. We also have a student question for you. This is Sophia's video. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sophia Lopez, and my question for NASA is, how is Perseverance going to survive? And here's a drawing that I made from Perseverance thinking about Earth. Thank you. Well, Sophia, Perseverance survives um, with a power source um, that charges its batteries uh, overnight while it sleeps, and it keeps heaters uh, on so that all of our critical electronics can stay warm, um, as well as our mechanism. But it's really uh, survived by the team um, that performs the health and safety assessments every day and communicates with the rover um, and makes sure that uh, she's, she's doing okay. Well, thanks for your time, Jessica, and good luck living on Mars time. Thank you. Should be fun. <laughs> Let's head back to Marina as she gives us a sneak peek into the future at JPL. Thanks so much, Raquel. It's definitely bustling behind me. Uh, it's not quiet like it was just 20 minutes ago. And congrats to the whole team. What an amazing accomplishment. Mike Watkins is the director of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He was the mission manager during the Curiosity rover landing on Mars. Welcome, Mike. Oh, thanks. Glad to, glad to be here. You can see all my mask markings on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were just celebrating, and rightly so. Now, you've been around for a number of Mars landings. What makes this one special? 
Well, you know, two things. I mean, it's the biggest and best rover we've ever sent to Mars, um, and, and it can really, you know, do amazing things in terms of, uh, you know, its own scientific exploration of this habitable environment, you know, at Jezero. Um, but, you know, it's also, as, as, as you've heard today, you know, it's the first step in Mars sample return. So really, you know, it's, it's not only doing its own mission, it's setting us up for a series of missions and to bring those samples back. And, you know, a lot of the effort to develop the rover uh, was specifically designed, you know, for that sampling and caching system. It's one of the most complex robotic systems ever made. And, uh, you know, having it down safely means Mars sample return continues right on course and, and, uh, and, and we are moving forward. Wonderful. Now, JPL has a long history with robotic space exploration. Why do you think it's so important to continue to push those boundaries? You know, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, obviously, it, you know, for, for places that are far away, like Mars, and even farther away, uh, you know, like Europa, uh, right now, robots are the, robotic exploration is the only way we can uh, make these scientific discoveries and really understand these early uh, habitable environments. In the case of Europa, maybe it's even still habitable. And, uh, you know, we're not ready to, to, to go there with astronauts yet, uh, but the robots are ready to go there. And so we always, uh, you know, are forerunners and pathfinders uh, of, of, of human exploration. And we start by sending, you know, our eyes and, and arms there in the form of a robot. And um, it is just fantastic to be able to do that and to learn from each rover, learn from the science and the engineering and make the next one better and make more and more discoveries. And every time we do one of these missions, we make fabulous discoveries. And, uh, and you know, each one is, is more exciting uh, than the last. The future does look exciting. Now, as director of JPL, what would you like to say to those teams right now celebrating? Oh, you know, obviously they they have earned it. Let me let me tell you. I mean, they uh, have worked, you know, for years and years on this mission. And then in the past year, of course, we had the COVID experience. And, and you know, I want to thank not only the team, but also, you know, all of JPL. You know, a lot of folks had to had to, uh, had to uh, pitch in here, you know, in terms of making sure our remote telework, you know, our, our IT systems were good enough to, to support folks working from home. You know, all of the folks looking at, uh, at PPE and our safe distancing and reconfiguring facilities uh, to make them safe uh, for the employees. Um, it's just an um, incredible amount of work by the entire lab and of course especially by this team and uh, you know and, and in one sense you know the, the seven minutes of terror are very exciting uh, but on the other hand you know the missions just started right we, we built the mission you know not to land but actually to drive and get the samples and do other uh, technology um, you know demonstrations and so you know for m much of the team you know uh, this part of the mission's over but but for most of the team the mission's really just starting and so uh, you know I think they're very excited but uh, you know everybody I think can take a big, uh, a deep breath and a sigh of relief uh, now that we are safely down on the surface. Yes, that collective sigh of relief. And I hear a lot of excitement and celebration behind me as well. So thanks so much for joining me, Mike. It's my pleasure. And thanks to everyone for joining us too. Congrats again to the Mars 2020 Perseverance team for a successful landing. Back to you, Raquel. Now, there will be a flight test coming up for the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. And if this technology experiment is successful, it would mark the first time we have taken a power controlled flight on another planet. Sometimes we have to do something just to show that you can do it. When the Wright brothers flew for the first time, they flew an experimental aircraft. And in the same way, the Mars helicopter is designed to show that we can fly powered helicopter flight in the Martian atmosphere. From day one, this was the unwavering dream of our team to get our helicopter launched to Mars so that we can get the opportunity to do the very first rotorcraft flight test in the actual environment of Mars. It's extremely difficult to fly at Mars because the atmosphere is so thin compared to Earth. At Mars, it's less than one percent. So the first and foremost challenge is to make a vehicle that's light enough to be lifted, and then the second is to generate lift. The rotor system has just been very fast. Two thousand, twenty-two hundred, twenty-four hundred. We're spinning between 2,000 and 3,000 revolutions per minute, and it takes a lot of energy. So it's that balance of a very light system, yet having enough energy that's needed to you know, spin the rotor so fast to lift, and on top of it, having to design in the autonomy. It has to be fully autonomous from the time it takes off to the time it lands. What we do do on the ground is we plan the flights, and so we determine from here where we want the helicopter to go. 
our experiment window is 30 Martian days. So we have planned uh, up to five flights of incremental difficulty. The very first flight, the main thing is we want to get the legs off the ground. And so we will basically go up uh, about three meters and we'll hover there uh, and then we'll come down again. And that will be the first, you know, really major milestone. Most of our flights will be at the three to five meter height. We will be going horizontally again at a few meters per second, probably go out, you know, 50, 70 meters and come back. In successive flights, we'll probably push that further, try to go further. So our priority will be to get back engineering telemetry and not so much images, but I'm sure we'll return a few, you know, because they'll always look cool. At this point, we've tested all we can on Earth. We have mathematical models that shows how it will fly at Mars, and we've tested it in the simulated environment that we can create on Earth. It really is time now to do the real flight test at Mars. Nothing is a given, but we have done everything we can in terms of a test program here on Earth. The vehicle is performing extremely well so far. It's been doing exactly the right thing even right now and is bolted onto the Perseverance rover. So there's a very good chance that we'll pull it off, yes. But it's still high risk and none of us forget that you could have a glitch that, you know, could mean end of mission, yes. It's going to be exciting, reacting to any surprises we have. We can't wait. <laughs> What's really most important is everything we're learning here is for the future 